Well, praise the Lord. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is uh, a uh, unusual time we're living in, right? Amen. A lot of a lot of things we uh, would like to see go, see going differently. How many of you are are uh, suffering with some kind of uh, respiratory or allergy symptoms. I think most of us are. Um, of course, here locally, we know we're getting an unusual amount of rain, and uh, that uh, that makes the uh, symptoms go into high gear and uh, on uh, supercharged uh, steroids or something, right? Amen. Well, the Lord said that... Uh, that the earth would groan and travail in the in the last times, didn't he? And he said it would be like a uh, a woman before she gives birth, and all of you uh, mothers can relate to that. And uh, it it really is. It really is. You know, I I don't know about. <laughs> I don't know about global warning, warming, but I, I do know that if the, if the globe is warming, that our Lord is in charge of it, then he's causing it. And I think, uh, I think that he is keeping us day by day, don't you? Have every confidence that he will keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. Oh, and that day is approaching. Uh, this Sunday will be Resurrection Day, and uh, we uh, we could make it all Jewish and have uh, um, you know a Passover celebration. But Jesus fulfilled that, didn't he? He completely fulfilled all the ritual of the law. Now, I think we can learn from learn from that, especially you know what the Bible has to say about the feast. They uh, they instruct us, they teach us, and the law is a schoolmaster to take us unto Christ. So, um, inter be an interesting discussion. So, I hope that you'll join right in with me and. Uh, uh, oh, we've got uh, uh, Brother John Heidi songs. Uh, yes. And he said, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Second Peter. Yes. Amen. And uh, is that John, is that from nuclear nuclear uh, fallout, nuclear war, nuclear weapons being set off? A lot of the Bible, you know, those prophecies, um, you know, when it talks about um, people's eyes running out of their head, that, uh, it, it sounds a lot like that, you know. And, of course, there were a lot of those kind of things going on when the Lord poured out the fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So, um, yes. We know he said we'd live in perilous times, and it is. It's it's perilous, okay? But I don't think he wants us to stay in the house. He doesn't want us to just not interact or, or be afraid all the time, does he? He's not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. So I'm glad to have uh, LaDonna, and we've got Rob and Carol, we've got Sissy and Butch, we've got Fred and Maria, we're going to pray for Maria, Fred, and uh, Butch and Sissy, um, Butch and Sissy, how are your kids doing? Uh, we've got them on the list, okay, and of course, the uh, the Holy Most Reverend Heidi has, uh, has graciously uh, blessed us with his presence. So uh, we have requests from Sunday. We're going to take together. All right. 
And, uh, oh, well, thank you, brother. Happy Resurrection Day to you, too. <clears throat> uh, you can you could ask you can ask my uh, my lovely wife um, what kind of day I've had physically <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of coughing and blowing and that type of thing I won't uh, give you any more details so we uh, I ask the Lord to help me and I believe He will I believe He'll give me uh, clarity and voice and um and uh help me uh stay in my right mind tonight amen so fathers we come to you tonight we just praise you we praise you we lift you up we glorify your holy name this holy week we thank you what it means to us oh we thank you lord for going all the way and not giving in not giving up and not letting down Oh, Lord, thank you for allowing the people of this fallen planet to take you and do all that, uh, that the Holy Father required to pay for our sins. And we just want to praise you for it and thank you that you not only carried our sins in your body on the tree, but you, by being, by going into Hades, Lord, you led captivity captive, and uh, you set them free too. And Lord, we know that your coming is imminent. Praise God. You rose from the grave. You ascended up, and we know in your coming again in like manner. Praise God. Praise God. Bless our country. Send revival. Send an awakening. Let the peace be upon Israel. Give them victory over everyone that, uh, that would dare to rise against them in any way. Have your way in Ukraine and all of the, uh, the Middle East tonight. Father, we pray for our, our, our people. Lord, uh, touch Sister Ina, touch her and help her, Lord. Minister to her physically and touch Sister Maria, Lord, who is uh, having uh, some problems physically. Touch her, Lord. We know she suffers so much with uh, her back and, and knees. And just minister to her. We pray for Don, Lord. You know all about... Uh, his current situation. And we pray for Sophie, Lord, spiritually minister to her, send her the right influence, help her, Lord, to be persuaded uh, that your way is the right way. And we pray that you would uh, touch up uh, Bill and Sherry's uh, ex-son-in-law, Todd, have your way in his life. We thank you for touching LaDonna and I Lord, you know the needs that we have, and uh, just uh, just heal, heal it on us back. God, give her victory in her body. Praise God. Meet every unspoken request. Uh, uh, you know uh, the circumstances with uh, Sissy's request about her kids at uh, in Red Bluff. We pray, Lord, that you continue to touch Rob's dad. And be with him and touch Carolina. Lord, uh, heal her of her uh, cold and allergy symptoms tonight. Help us in the ministry of the word tonight and uh, in song. And be glorified, we pray, in all that is said and done tonight on this YouTube broadcast. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to try to try to sing. Uh, my favorite uh, Easter song, and uh, it's a good one. It kind of tells tells the whole story. What a day! <clears throat> what a day when Jesus went all the way to the went all the way to the end and fulfilled all the prophecies of the Word of God. 
Amen. One day. <coughs> I don't want this to pop off. <coughs> Praise God. Now I sing it with me if you know it. One day. Lord for helping us get through that much. <coughs> I was going to sing all five verses, but uh, you don't need to listen to me cough that much. <coughs> but so those high notes tend to kind of make make it happen. All right, all right, all right. glory to God. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try this again, and I hope that it's in a good mood. Um, listen real close, okay? Alexa, what is the definition of worldview? A worldview is a person's overall perspective on life, how they interpret the world, and how they view reality. It encompasses their beliefs, values, and assumptions about the world. A worldview is typically defined as a comprehensive philosophy or view of life. Individuals often hold a number of different worldviews, each of which guides their understanding of the world and how they interact with it. Did that answer your question? Yes, that's a, that's a feedback. worldly view. Um, do, you, do you have a lot of different worldviews? <laughs> We'd like to 
we'd like to per persuade you of God's worldview tonight. Okay. Um, have you have you ever heard of George Barna? I know John has. Um, he wrote a book, uh, wrote several books. Uh, one of them was Think Like Jesus. And uh, he makes this ob observation I'm, I'm going to read. <clears throat> he said, most Americans are immersed in daily exercises of covert worldview training via the mass media, public law, public school education, the Internet, and conversations with peers. Okay. In other words, from the time you wake up in the morning until you go to sleep at night, there are forces constantly coming at you, infiltrating your mind, shaping your worldview. So what's a worldview? Another definition. Worldview is made up of all the assumptions in your mind. Okay? Uh, our Someone said our perspective is our reality, right? Whether conscious or subconscious about how the world really works. Another definition says a worldview is, first of all, an explanation, an interpretation of the world, second, an application of this view to life. Worldview is what you believe about life, and it determines how you behave in this life. Okay, I think that's pretty good. All right, Butch and Sissy said the kids are doing much better. Well, we praise the Lord for that. Thank you for that good report. So let's pray. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you hear us and you do answer prayer. And Lord, we, we know that you're helping us every day, Lord. Day after day, you bless us and you meet with us, and you supply all of our needs. We thank you for your gracious loving kindness. Lord, help us in uh, looking at this truth tonight, and um, let your word minister to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, here's the scary part. Most of the influences that come at you lead to a worldview in opposition to God and a biblical worldview. So I think uh, as a pastor that I need to address that, don't you? Don't you think so? You could be a sincere follower of Jesus Christ who truly loves the Lord and wants to serve him, but because of your worldview... You could be actually living contrary to God's will. And so what I want to do this evening is make you aware of what's influencing you and programming your mind. You know, we like to think, you know, that we are we're independent and, uh, you know, we're, we're not moved uh, in any way by, uh, by any kind of uh, outside influences. But, um, you know, it, it, does, it doesn't happen overtly, but it can happen uh, covertly. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Hey, Sharon. How are you feeling, Sharon? It's good to see you on the, on the chat line tonight. Praise God. All right. I also want to show you how to shut down the influences that oppose God and intentionally begin developing a worldview that pleases the Lord. Are we all in agreement that we need to do that? There are signs that, uh, that you can look for to see it. In fact, your worldview has been influenced by ungodly, ungodly things. Okay. And, uh, you know, you can, you can deny that, but uh, it does happen. 
and we have to watch. We have to watch ourselves all the time. That's why Jesus said, in the context of the last days, to watch, be aware. You know, don't um, don't be a, a a Christian ostrich and stick your head uh, in a hole somewhere, and and uh, or like that character in in. Uh, um, the Pilgrim's Progress, you know, that put his hands over his ears and ran away, you know, uh, something like that. Well, the book of James, I'd like you to turn to, and uh, because it provides us with some clues that our worldview is corrupted, if it is. Okay. All right. This New Testament letter was uh, penned by James, the brother of Jesus, before he was martyred. And uh, he was uh, the leader of the church for a while in Jerusalem. At one point, persecution broke out against the Greek-speaking Jews who had converted to Christianity. And uh, since they weren't native-born Jews, uh, when they came, they came to faith in Jesus in uh, en masse, uh, big big bunch of them, in other words. Okay. All right. Bill said we just got home from a wild and crazy day, but in church now. All right. Good to, good to see you on tonight, brother. We prayed for you. Okay, and so. They were not, uh, these Greeks were not native-born Jews. Okay, and so the religious established attempted to squash them, just like the others. The result was what, uh, that most of them fled Jerusalem and headed into the Gentile or non-Jewish world, okay? But, you know, God allowed it, uh, just like he allowed the spread all over uh, Europe and Asia. The people that knew Jesus, they spread the message wherever they went, didn't they? <clears throat> so the book of James was written to them so they'd know how to conduct themselves in this Christ-rejecting uh, world as followers of his in a world that was set in opposition to the one true God. And that's because the God of this world um, is trying every way that he can to sway uh, influence away from the truth, isn't he? And they were like a, a lot of us when we leave our home, church, or fellowship groups, <coughs> we find ourselves immersed in a culture that's anti-Christian to the core. I mean, unless you go to a uh, church camp or church activity. <clears throat> Bear with me. How should we then live in such an environment? Well, James warns us not to let our worldview become corrupted because the results will be behaviors in opposition to the way of Christ. Okay. So as I read these next few verses from chapter 4, keep in mind that these were written to genuine believers, not pagans. Also be aware that some of what he says is hyperbole, exaggerated descriptions that point to a spiritual truth. Okay. Uh, James chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 1, 2, and 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, and you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Okay? And, of course, the King James says, you ask not, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Okay? And that, uh, that's a problem with us sometimes. 
So there's some clear warning signs that something is wrong. And one of the issues James points to is a relational turmoil. Anger, bitterness, envy, quarreling, backbiting, gossiping, slander. These were all symptoms among Christians that something is wrong. Now, we never have we never have anything like that going on. I know, yeah, right. We we live above all of those things. Uh, these were all symptoms um, uh, in every generation, right? The way that we treat one another is a huge spiritual indicator. Much of the problem can be traced to another warning sign. Uh, this uh, me first attitude, which Paul predicted that uh, men would be lovers of their own selves. And we see it, don't we? If you're self-obsessed, the bell is ringing loudly by the Holy Spirit that something is wrong. You got to have your way, my way or the highway, looking out for number one. You know, however you want to color it or dress it up, it's a sure sign that something godless is up within you. Okay? Okay. <laughs> and then we see also that some of these people were spiritually disconnected. The vital relationship that they once had with God had withered. It can happen. Their prayers were no longer answered. Many of them had given up seeking the Lord. And your faith, uh, your faith life loses its joy. You're passive concerning the things of God when an encounter with Jesus is a past event and not a daily reality. It's a warning sign. Okay? You could sum it up this way. If you love, if your love for God and other people is growing, your worldview is probably just fine. You know, but we, we, need, to be, we need to be very honest with ourselves on that, don't we? We just, and we need to, uh, uh, if necessary, be firm with ourselves, right? Nobody likes to do that. Um, you know, we just like to be, well, maybe I better speak for myself. I like to be pampered and petted. I like, I like to be waited on. Okay. And uh, we would rather, the flesh would rather be served than served. You find that you're not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. <clears throat> it's a warning sign, isn't it? Your worldview has suffered some corruption, and there's some need of intervention. James addresses the actions and attitudes of these people, but he quickly moves to the underlying reasons for their behavior. Okay. He said, uh, getting to the heart of the matter, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. You think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives more grace. And that's why the scripture says, uh, and verses 4 through 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We need to just really take that to heart. We need to get a new grip on that truth, don't we? So that's strong language. How would you feel, um, you know, if I came to you and I looked you in the eye and called you an adulterer? problem, as James saw it, was these Christians had let their guard down. They were allowing godless influences to creep into their minds and distort their worldview. These people were truly saints of God. They'd been redeemed by the Lord because of his grace, by their faith in Jesus Christ. They had good hearts, but their minds had been corrupted and their actions followed. They may not, may not even have been aware that they'd made friends with the world and become enemies of God. Okay? It, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. 
But it does happen, and when it happens, it's, imper it's imperceptibly creeping. And that's a challenge for us. These agents are most effective at corrupting a godly worldview, and they're subtle, unnoticed. Most of us are wise enough to avoid, uh, uh, like ACDC, screeching at us to join them on the highway to hell. I don't imagine that's on your playlist. I hope not. But what did we do with Jewel when she sweetly affirms that we're all okay and that in the end only kindness matters? <laughs> <clears throat> Christian parents sometimes get all worked up when they find their kids possessing trading cards that are cultic in nature. Not a lot of us in this audience have kids, but about all of us have young grandkids, don't we? And we definitely have some influence there. And, uh, you know, we... we uh, I believe God holds us accountable uh, for our being silent in some of these things. The hidden message is that it's more blessed to receive than it is to give, usually. Get all you can for yourself. <coughs> so the hidden message is more, uh, it's just that. Sometimes we hear a collective Christian protest about the decadence on TV or the violence and sexuality of video games, but hardly anyone catches the worldview behind massive amounts of TV watching and game playing that says it's okay to waste all your life in front of a flashing, purposeless box. Okay? Yeah, we, we have a television in our house. But I'm not lying. I don't want to be like that guy that said, uh, you know, that uh, asked the church, uh, please pray for me, you know, that God cleans up my my VCR. Uh, okay. Uh, we need to get back to looking seriously at redeem the time, because the days are evil. So what? are the competing worldviews that threaten to infiltrate our minds, covertly affecting our beliefs and actions. I'm going to talk about a few of them. And, uh, you know, as always, I'm not here to entertain you. Uh, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, you said it's Holy Week. Why aren't you uh, bringing something on the passion of Christ? Because... I felt distinctly the Holy Spirit wanted me to go this direction tonight. And uh, I'm, I want to follow him. And I think you want me to follow him, don't you? In our culture, the single most, most persuasive worldview is naturalism. Now, nothing to do with taking your clothes off and going for a walk in the woods. I hope you don't take them all off, but naturalism is a view that the physical or natural world is all there is. It's a belief that natural causes can explain everything that exists. All came into existence through explainable physical processes. God is not needed in the explanation. And the idea of evolution arises from naturalism. Theory goes that all living creatures arose from a simpler life form into the diversity and complexity that we see today. Humanity is not the unique creation of a loving and holy God, <clears throat> but the product of blind chance. So our origin resulted from physical processes that brought an unthinking, warm, primordial ooze and not the purposeful craftsmanship of an infinite creator. I don't think anybody in our group uh, uh, is drawn to that, but I said we were uh, talking about different ideas on the subject, and um, hopefully you'll be better prepared and not shocked when you run into it out there. 
I bet the majority of you would uh, reject naturalism. Most of us would scoff at the very idea of evolution. Naturalism is too in your face. <clears throat> but I bet the majority of us accept some of the more subtle worldviews that spring from naturalism. You ever, hold, you ever heard of moral relativism? Okay. Now, some people call it postmodernism. It's the absolute belief that there's an there is no absolute truth. All religions are the same. All paths lead to the same God. Your truth may be truth for you, but it's not truth from me or for me, and that's okay. Let's hold hands and have a Coke or something, you know. If there are no absolutes of right or wrong for you, if the Koran is just as valid as the Bible, if Jesus is just one of many ways to heaven, your worldview has been corrupted. I hope somebody tunes in and needs to hear this and just is caused a cause to wake up. Another insidious worldview is pragmatism. <coughs> I apologize for coughing. Let me get a shot of uh, the throat spray here. All right. Pragmatist says, whatever works. This one is not new. Back in the Renaissance, a guy named Machiavelli wrote a book called The Prince. His main idea was that the ends justify the means. As long as the end result is good. It doesn't matter how ruthless or immoral you have to be to get there. And pragmatism will permit you to lie, cheat, and steal to achieve a positive result in your life. Doesn't that make you want to uh, regurgitate? Try not to get caught. Adherence to pragmatism supports a woman's decision to abort her baby if it's going to be an inconvenience in her life, doesn't it? Pragmatically, it makes sense to euthanize the mentally handicapped, the aged, the terminally ill, and the physically disabled. And after all, they cost more than they can contribute. The world is um, heading for a time where that's going to be practiced again, I'm sad to report. A pragmatist says it's okay to cheat on your taxes as long as you don't get caught. Pragmatist has no problem with committing fraud against an insurance company, concluding that company has plenty of money, and as long as I don't get caught, they won't miss it. The sneaky little sister of naturalism is materialism. Yeah, it's the idea that the only thing there is is this world only, and the one who dies with the most toys wins. I think... Uh, Frank Sinatra was famous for saying that the world is my oyster. The materialist finds happiness in money and the things it can buy. Give me money. That's what I want. If your decisions in life are based primarily on how to maximize your money, the worldview of materialism has slipped into your mind. You spend time fantasizing about winning the lottery or some kind of sweepstakes, sure sign of materialism. <laughs> uh, I remember about a fellow that uh, he won uh, won the lottery, but he was uh, he made sure that he paid his tithes on it. <laughs> <clears throat> you come to believe that money, more money is the answer to your problems and not God, you're in trouble. An alien worldview can slip into your mind and skew your actions away from the kind of life that God wants you to live. When we allow the other worldviews to influence, James calls it friendship with the world. Friendship with the world makes us enemies toward God, not in our hearts, but in our actions. And we can become spiritual adulterers, attempting to maintain our allegiance 
to our Heavenly Father while setting up altars to false gods in our lives. Yes, it is idolatry. Yes. Not let on said in the end, only salvation matters. Okay. All right. Some of these things, some of these things war against the soul of God's people. That's why James addressed it, didn't he? How do you get your mind right with God? All right, James chapter 4, 7 through 10. He says, submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. <coughs> well, that's the place to begin. <coughs> Submit means to bring yourself voluntarily in his direction. Therefore, our first step must be to invite God's inspection. And it could be really tough for most of us to do that, but that's what, well, that's what we need to do. Ask God to show you what parts of your life are displeasing to him and where the influence is coming from. And when he reveals it, don't spend time beating yourself up or feeling guilty. Don't label yourself, call yourself names, or give up. Your heart is good. You're born again. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a new life, your new creation. Your inclination really is to obey God and live in a righteous manner. But you might need to do some deprogramming. If there's a virus in your hard drive of your mind, it's got to be rooted out. Okay? All right. John says humanism has a hidden word. And humanism has a hidden word within its letters, spelled backwards. Can you find that word? Either way, putting man above God is still sin. Okay. A little challenge there. Okay. Um, you know, the Bible says if we judge ourselves, we won't be judged. So if you've got some treachery going on, feel the weight of that. Okay. Uh, although, you know, we get set up, so to speak, by false worldview, we're still responsible for actions. And you can't plead that the devil of the world made you do it. Your behaviors are your choice. Feel the weight of it. Call it what it is. If you're not broken up over your unfaithfulness to God, then you're not really repentant. Okay? You won't do what's necessary to make a change unless there is some remorse involved. Okay. So James uses strong language with his people because he wants them to feel and know the truth. Know the truth logically is good, but adding the emotions to it brings genuine change. Just kind of works that way. He called them adulterers and idolaters so that they would feel it and be motivated to combat the godless worldview influencing their behavior. You'll only purify your heart and wash your hands and go on to compl a complete commitment to Christ when you felt the weight of your treachery against God. All right? The repentance should lead us naturally to step three. Okay. We had one and two. Halt the flow of godless propaganda. Amen. Do a little self-evaluation. What sorts of things do you set before your eyes on a regular basis? What do you typically read and meditate upon? 
What do you listen to? What kinds of conversations do you have? Who do you respect as authoritative in your life? In other words, assess all of your influencers and halt the flow of their propaganda if you can. Okay. I'm positive that it'll mean giving up some things that you really cherish and enjoy. I think this is what James was getting at when he said, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I didn't mean that we should adopt a perpetually sour expression or that life as a Christian is supposed to be a misery. He's pointing to sacrifice for the Lord's sake. The things that make us laugh or kept us entertained, that injected a false worldview, we're to give up. Treat as a thing of as a thing of that brings gloom and sorrow. And he'll replace whatever we give up with something far better, won't he? I believe that. The joy of knowing that we're doing his will, the joy of his presence and pleasure. We need to actively pursue a Christ-centered worldview. Remember that quote from George Barna I read earlier. Let me read it in the fuller context that most Americans are immersed in daily exercises of covert, covert worldview training via the mass media, public law, public school education, the Internet, and conversations with peers. And only an intentional process designed to develop, integrate, and apply a biblical life lens can protect us from the savage mental and spiritual assault that occurs every day. Okay? That's, uh, if you want to explore that further, that's from George Barna's book, Think Like Jesus. So we can't be passive about it. We can't simply say, uh, simply uh, stay on the defense. You got to get active and aggressive must participate in the formation of your own worldview. You've got to program your own onboard computer. Amen. Praise God. You know, we uh, they make computers so disposable when the hard drive gets corruptible, we replace it. Well, we can't we we can't uh, uh, replace our internal spiritual hard drive, but God can change it, can't he? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. It's a prayer to pray. I think it goes without saying, you, you've got to know the Bible. Amen. We ought to know the Word of God like we know the back of our hand. And you'll only have a Christian worldview by constantly reading, studying, meditating on it, and when possible, memorizing the Scriptures. You can't develop a godly worldview without knowing the Bible. You can't do God's will without knowing his inspired written word. Get in it daily. Make getting a handle on the word of God one of your top priorities. Paul called the word of God the sword of the spirit. It's your weapon of defense and attack. Okay? And uh, it's... The only, uh, well, you could make the argument about the, the killer shoes that he told us to wear, but um, because the Roman soldiers uh, uh, did a lot of damage with those spiked uh, shoes, but the sword, their sword was the main weapon of offense, wasn't it? You must also begin, if you haven't already, filling your mind with godly images. If all you do is halt the flow of godless propaganda, you'll create a vacuum. <clears throat> we all know nature of whores a vacuum, so fill it with good stuff. I don't know what this will mean for you, so I'm getting, I'm going to keep it vague. <clears throat> I am sorry I'm doing so much coughing. Thinking primarily of arts and entertainment, 
We need to find the good stuff and fill our mind with that. Right? And Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, um, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. It's also imperative that we seek out community with other Christians who sincerely desire to walk with God. And you need to counteract the influence of godlessness in this world with the opposing views of the followers of Christ. All right? That uh, I used to say about... Uh, you know, the computers, garbage in and garbage garbage in, garbage out. And that's true with our, our computer, our mental computers, right? Uh, we need two or three godly people we can talk to, uh, uh, you know, with uh, more uh, than just sports and the weather. Get in a group, find a group. And the Proverbs tells us that whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Some people find it helpful to study the lives of men and women from the past who walk with God and study how they lived and not just what they accomplished, pattern your life and way of thinking after some of theirs. I think that's good. There was a great movie in 2009 around about that time entitled Amazing Grace about a outstanding Christian named William Wilberforce. In the 1700s, he stood up against slavery and the slave trade in England. Almost no one else was speaking out about this issue because most Englishmen, including the Christians, were captive to a worldview that said treating another human being like a beast is just fine. Everybody does it. If you can make money in the process, uh, all the better. So Wilberforce had Christ in his heart and in his mind, and he stood up. He faced opposition, scorn, persecution, and death threats, but nothing could shut him up or make him back down. Shortly before his death, as a direct result of his efforts, England banned both the slave trade and slavery itself. Wilberforce, Wilberforce wrote the following, If the affections of the soul are not supremely fixed on God, and if our dominant desire and primary goal is not to possess God's favor and to promote his glory, then we are traitors in revolt against our law, lawful sovereign. And whether we're slaves of greed, sensuality, amusement, sloth, or the devotees devoted to ambition, taste, fashion, we can alike estrange ourselves from the dominion of our rightful sovereign, Jesus Christ. Chuck Colson uh, said that in his Breakpoint Commentary, A Tale of Two Servants. Uh, William Wilberforce changed the world because Jesus had his heart and his mind. Well, if you don't get anything else, get that. Okay. John said, whatever informs us, conforms us. Amen. Um, that's a good thought, isn't it? Amen. Our world is desperate and, and desperately in need of uh, men and women like William Wilberforce stand up and stand out for Christ rather than following the herd. If you'll let Christ change your mind through you, he will change the world, maybe starting with just your immediate family. You must be intentional about developing your worldview. Remember that everything has a shaping effect on us spiritually. Be discerning about what you allow through the gate of your mind. 
the gate of your ear or the gate of your eye. And if we let Christ change our mind through you, you will change the world. Oh, come on, Pastor. That's um, really high and lofty ideals and really unrealistic. Um, it, it sounds that way, but that's, that's a promise of the Word of God, isn't it? Jesus needs more than just your hearts to make a difference. He needs your hands, your voice. To get those, he must have your mind. And so if you let Christ change your mind through you, he will change the world. Amen. Okay. Donna said, I meant God above all. And uh, that little heart uh, blocks things at the end of the sentence. And uh, if it's all the way at the bottom, I can't uh, read it until it gets up a ways. All right. So... Uh, that's all I have on that. Amen. Thank you for participating, you all. Good to, good to have John, John and Judy are back in in Arkansas and uh, getting some rest and uh, R&R &R and all that good stuff, I think. <coughs> i tell you what, they don't... <coughs> They don't let any grass grow under their feet. I guess I better stop before I um, blow this uh, microphone up. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. God is good, greatly to be praised. God above all, our all and over all. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, those of you that were on and participated tonight. Pray for our service Sunday morning. Okay? And uh, well, we'll have to see. Uh, see about Sunday night. Okay? That hasn't been fully decided yet. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and mercy, your gracious, loving kindness. Thank you for, for who you are and all that you've done, Jesus. Lord, draw us nearer to you. Move in us, Lord, in such a way that we become more like you. And uh, bless the rest of the week of all of our brothers and sisters. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We will see you here. Try to be here, if at all possible. Because you know what? Sometimes people will go to church on Easter. They don't go any other time. And so we need you. We need you here. We need you here every Sunday, but especially this Sunday. Okay? God bless you. Good night.